Hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel discussion on teacher training on student privacy and ed tech. My name is Juliana Cotto, and I'm a policy fellow on the youth and education team at the Future of Privacy Forum. I will be your moderator for today's discussion that is co-hosted by the George Mason University Antonin Scalia Law School, Lawn Economic Center's Program on Economics and Privacy, and the Future of Privacy Forum. Before introducing our wonderful panelists for today's discussion, I just briefly wanted to go over some logistics. One, as you probably have already noticed, your cameras and mics have been turned off for this event, but we do ask any questions that you have to please submit them with the Q&A function, which we will be monitoring. Um, and a last note, this webinar will be recorded and we will be distributing the recording to all attendees. Um, and then next, just wanted to show you briefly our agenda for today. And with that, I will now introduce our panelists. So we have James Cooper, Associate Professor of Law and Director for the Program on Economics and Privacy at George Mason University Antonin Scalia Law School. He brings over a decade of public and private sector experience through his research and teaching. He served as Deputy and Acting Director of the Federal Trade Commission's Office of Policy Planning, Advisor to Federal Trade Commissioner William Kovacic, and as an Associate in the Antitrust Group of Kroll and Mourning. Next, we have Carrie Gallagher, Assistant Principal for Teaching and Learning at St. John's Prep in Danvers, Massachusetts. She's also the Director of K-12 Education for ConnectSafely.org, which is an internet safety nonprofit in Palo Alto, California. She's also a Future Ready Instructional Coach, ASCD Emerging Leader, Adobe Education Leader, PBS Learning Media Digital Innovator, and Ed Surge Columnist. She served as a middle school and high school teacher, digital learning specialist, and administrator for nearly 20 years. Next, we have Lori Owens, a leader in technology and education, both in California and nationally. She currently serves as the chief technology officer for the San Mateo County Office of Education. She's also the immediate past president of California IT and Education, also known as SITE, and a past chairperson of California Technology Steering Committee. She has taught current and aspiring chief technology officers in California and is a regular speaker at conferences and events throughout California and across the nation. And last but not least, we have Amelia Vance, Director of Youth and Education Privacy at the Future of Privacy Forum. Amelia advises policymakers, academics, companies, districts, and states on child and student privacy law and best practices, oversees the Student Privacy Compass website and the review of applicants to the Student Privacy Pledge, and convene stakeholders to ensure the responsible use of student data and ed tech in schools. Prior to FPF, Amelia was the director of the Education Data and Technology Project at the National Association of State Boards of Education. So before jumping into our panel discussion, we're first going to hear a short presentation from James Cooper on key takeaways and insights from his report that I believe was uh, made public and published today titled Elementary School Teacher Use of EdTech Preliminary Teacher Survey Results. Brief description on the report. So the report uses information from an online survey of elementary school educators from 110 schools across 95 school districts in nine states to shed light on how elementary school teachers utilize EdTech. And so with that, I'm going to pass it over to James. Uh, thanks a lot, Juliana. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and a pleasure to be on such an august panel. Uh, I, I've always been a huge fan of FPF's work and have, have done, this is uh, the, one of a, a few programs that I've, that I've done with you guys and it's always uh, a pleasure to, to be able to team up and uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about the opportunity to talk about our new report and it, uh, as, as you mentioned, had just, uh, had just been released. And uh, I, let me just get a, a check that everyone's seeing the title page of the report right now. Yes. Uh, awesome, all right. So uh, as, as Juliana mentioned uh, today, uh, the Program in Economics and Privacy, we just uh, re released a report on uh, elementary school uh, teacher use of ed, ed tech. Uh, and let, uh, a little bit about the, just a quick background, it's interesting and, and, and I think altogether fitting and proper, to paraphrase Abraham Lincoln, that uh, I'm on a panel with Amelia for this because this, in many ways, uh, the genesis of this report, the idea came from a long conversation uh, with, with Amelia over coffee uh, 
about uh, ed tech and, and, and privacy back in the day when you could actually get together with someone in a coffee shop. Um, I look forward to those days, days again. Uh, but uh, with my FTC background, I'd always think I kind of had an interest in, in privacy and um, I started, uh, and then I, I read this article uh, that uh, Amelia did with uh, Jules Polonetsky, the, the head of FPF on Louisiana's, um, uh, on a privacy law that Louisiana had, had passed and its potential chilling effects on, um, on the impact on, on teachers' willingness to use that tech. And, and so that kind of got me uh, thinking about, I, I primarily do empirical work, and so I was interested in, in, in looking at the impact of state privacy laws on, on the use of that tech. And Amelia, of course, is the expert, so we got together and we discussed this. So, so that, I just want to, again, kind of, uh, uh, it's great that I'm getting to finally reveal the results of this study. Uh, on, and I apologize for the sirens in the background there, um, the, uh, with, with Amelia and, uh, and, and Carrie and Lori on, on, this, on this panel. Uh, so just quick, uh, Juliana already sort of gave a little bit of background. We did an online survey that was sent out to elementary school teachers over the 2018-19 school year. Uh, we, we have nine states and they were chosen uh, to get a variation in privacy laws. Some do not have any student privacy laws that, that apply. And we were looking at student privacy laws that apply to uh, ed tech in particular. Many, many states uh, have FERPA-esque type laws that deal with student records, but we're looking for laws that dealt specifically with, the, uh, with, with, with ed tech. Uh, so we wanted to get a variation in, in, in those laws. And so we ended up with a sample of 90, 93 school districts and um, 111 schools. So just some uh, key findings in, uh, wanna go through quickly is uh, with respect to ed tech use. And ed tech, you can read the report. Uh, my, my, my plug is uh, uh, the, the pep.gmu.edu. You'll find the, the, the report uh, there. Um, you, the, and you can read the report of how we defined ed tech uh, kind of broadly to, to encompass a lot of, lot of things. Uh, but almost everybody in the survey reported using ed tech in the classroom, 90, 97%. Um, only 41% reported using ed tech uh, for assigning some sort of ed tech for homework or using ed tech for homework, but it varies by grade. Not surprisingly, you find it's much more common in the higher grades because, of course, you know, kindergarten, we surveyed elementary school teachers. So we had basically K through six, uh, and most of the respondents were really K through five. Uh, that uh, not surprisingly, the younger grades don't really have homework. So you, you, it, there is a variation across grades. Uh, the most common type of ed tech used is video. This actually uh, matches up nicely uh, with, a, with, with, a, with a survey that um, Common Sense Media recently put out covering very similar, uh, very similar area. Where, uh, and, and they found that video was kind of the, the, the king and, and it appears that to be the case. And then web-based apps are the most commonly used for homework, meaning say Google, Google Apps or Class Dojo using that to, to give assignments to, to their students. Um, and found that, that most of the respondents said they use some sort of platform to communicate with students and parents, but somewhat surprisingly, uh, only 43% of the respondents report using uh, social media like Twitter or Facebook to either broadcast information about the school or um, uh, to, 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 to broadcast information about the school to the community or, 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 or more broadly. So what are some of the key findings that we found with respect to, 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 to privacy? Well, 57% uh, of the sample reported having some kind of privacy training and half of those who said they had privacy training had done it more than once. 77% uh, of, the, of, of the respondents said that there were some type of ed tech guidelines in place for them uh, to, to refer to that they told them what they could use, uh, uh, what sort of consents they had to get. So uh, uh, a majority of the respondents were at least somewhat familiar with FERPA, COPPA, and state privacy laws. Uh, FERPA had the largest familiarity followed by their state privacy law, and um, right at 50% were familiar with um, COPPA. Um, but I think one of the key takeaways or key findings from this report 
is that we find this positive relationship between, between the presence of, of training guidelines and privacy awareness. And I'll just show you a couple of charts. Um, here is, do you read privacy policies for ed tech? And you see those with privacy training are much more likely to always read or sometimes read and much less likely to ne never read privacy. And here is, it was, was kind of an open-ended question about where different categories you might think of privacy. And you see on the right-hand side of the group of respondents that had privacy training, and in every category, um, they are more likely to consider privacy in all these different categories like emailing students, emailing parents, uh, online posting, uh, uh, et cetera. You see the same pattern uh, emerge with respect to the presence of guidelines. Uh, again, uh, more likely to you know, always or read, read privacy policies and less likely to never read pol privacy policies if there are, are guidelines in place. And again, you see the same um, pattern with respect to privacy uh, awareness in various circumstances. That again, a positive association between the presence of guidelines and uh, privacy awareness. So um, let me just conclude here uh, so we can get into our panel discussion uh, on some, what I see as some key takeaways uh, from, from the report is that administrative action is positively correlated with, with privacy awareness. And what do I mean by that is that, you know, you see privacy training and privacy guidelines, those are in the hands of the, the, the administration. They can, uh, they, can, they can affect that. I also want to emphasize as an economist, I want to make sure that I'm saying this is positively correlated. I can't really make, given the data structure, certainly cannot make any, any causal claims. I mean, causation could work in, in a variety of different ways. And so all we find right now, though, is a statistically significant correlation between guidelines, training, and, pri and different measures of privacy awareness. Uh, somewhat surprisingly uh, is that there really is no statistical relationship between state privacy laws and ed tech use. I, I was expecting maybe to find that uh, especially, again, I told you that Amelia and Jules article about the potential chilling effects of Louisiana laws, I was expecting to maybe find some chilling impact, and uh, it doesn't show up in the data. Uh, and maybe in some ways it's not surprising because given, because with, other than Louisiana, all the privacy laws that we sampled that apply to ed tech, they apply to the tech providers, not to the teachers. So, uh, you know, in some ways, maybe it gives teachers more comfort, uh, and they're more willing to they're more willing to to uh, use ed tech because uh, be, because they know that the providers uh, there there is some some regulatory framework to uh, to to limit the ability of the providers to use uh, use data. So future work uh, definitely would like to have a larger sample. This, in some ways, was a pilot study constrained by by resources and time. Uh, so we chose a, you know, only nine states but, and, and a limited number of schools within those states. But um, uh, I'd like to get a larger sample. Also, it'd be interesting to get a time component so we could uh, set up, we could capture changes in state laws to set up what, uh, a treatment and control framework, which maybe would allow for potential causal inference in some of these questions. Um, and, and then finally, it would be interesting to the extent, it does, you know, to the extent that these results hold up and that, that they do not seem to impact teachers' willingness to use that. Of course, it would be, they, they do impact providers. They, this is, and it'd be interesting to see if even though there's no limit, no apparent reduction in the use of ed tech, if the resources are available or, or more limited in some of these states with privacy laws because of the, 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 the perhaps only you know, larger companies who don't rely on monetization via ads. Maybe they're, they're the ones who can afford to come into this space uh, as opposed to others. So that would be another kind of interesting area of, uh, area of future work. So uh, with, without any uh, further delay, I'll stop sharing my screen here and we can um, get into the panel discussion that I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to, to hearing from Amelia and, and, and especially Lori and Carrie who are on the ground doing this to, to, to see how maybe some of these findings resonate with what, what they, they find on the ground and hear about their experiences. So again, thanks, uh, uh, thanks for the platform here. I, I certainly enjoyed uh, being able to share the report. 
Great. Thank you, James, for presenting on your findings. We're definitely going to be including those insights and takeaways throughout our discussion. Um, and just a reminder for the audience to continue to submit questions uh, via the Q&A function. Um, and with that, a great, a, a first question I wanted to ask that I think could help ground our conversation open to all panelists is, why should teachers care about student privacy? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start that uh, answer um, just from the perspective of uh, working in a public um, entity in, in California. And I think that the, the whole role of the teacher is to uh, not only educate, but also to protect uh, students. And, and so it, it's inherent and it's very important for the teacher to care about the privacy of students. Uh, when, you, when you think about, for example, a situation in which student records may be co-opted or may be um, stolen uh, by those bad guys out there, uh, where if that happens to us, we would probably know fairly immediately because something would show up in our credit records or whatever. Uh, for students, particularly the very young, um, they're not going to see that or their parents are not going to know that because you can't put a, a watch on a, a, a minor's credit record, they don't have one yet, um, they're not going to know that until they're about 18 or maybe 16 if they start working, you know, somewhere in that time frame. And then, yes, it can be cleaned up, but then there's a whole lot of uh, work and, and damage that's done there. And I've heard some pretty horrible stories about students whose records have been co-opted for years um, and they had all kinds of things on their records. So that's, that it's incumbent upon students and up on schools and on administrators to protect our kids as best we can in the in the digital world. And of course, we really don't want to get to the place where their information might get out to people who may be preying on them and you know trying to kidnap them or assault them in some way. So we really do. Teachers and everybody in, in education have a responsibility and should make not only care but make it central to what they do to protect student records. I could just add to that. I think that learning about data privacy is actually um, like an essential life skill. And most adults don't really have a good understanding of how they're sharing their information when they're using online tools that they use um, over the course of their work day or even in their personal lives to um, communicate, especially now because it's our main form of communication with others. So when we teach um, educators about data privacy in order for them to fulfill their fundamental role, like Lori mentioned, of protecting children in addition to educating them. We're also providing them with a life skill that will allow them to protect themselves and their family members. Um, I know that as we've done the trainings at my school, um, once our teachers have a better understanding of what data privacy is and how important it is, they're so grateful that we have policies in place that make it so that they don't have to be the ones reading all the privacy policies, that they can rely on us to help them with that um, and provide them with the feedback that they need so that they can really focus on the teaching, which it should be their day-to-day -day focus um, because we want as much of their attention as possible on the quality of their, the children's experiences in the classroom and not on all the legal wrangling that needs to be done behind the scenes to create the solid policies that Lori's talking about. Absolutely. Um, and uh, Juliana, especially because uh, I know as your boss that you're a former teacher um, I, in a couple of uh, major urban school districts. Um, I almost want to quiz you on it. Um, hold off at least for the moment. But I think as uh, Carrie and Lori have stated, once teachers find out some of the initial like, oh, this could harm my students' um, futures, whether financial, whether safety, um, you know, this is something that the district is doing not as a barrier, um, but as a support. Um, this is something that respects my students' agency. Um, and uh, not only, you know, the future opportunities uh, that credit history, et cetera, um, uh, can be undermined here, but also the day-to-day -day trust between students and teachers when it comes to making sure that their IEP is kept confidential, making sure that 
uh, their discipline information isn't, you know, available to anyone or unintentionally disclosed. Um, making sure that, you know, analytics, um, metadata information uh, through an app, particularly right now, um, as it's so important to uh, monitor students' um, social emotional state. There's a lot of students undergoing a lot of trauma right now. That's pretty sensitive data. You're collecting a lot of information that, you know, is a going somewhere and it is vital that there be trust between students and parents and teachers uh, as their teacher as representatives of the school to make sure that we can really take care of students in the way we so desperately need to especially right now thank you for all those responses james did you want to jump in here um i i mean i I, I think it's all, all been said. I mean, to the extent, I mean, obviously uh, privacy is something that's uh, very important. And as a, as a, as a parent, uh, I know I kind of give that uh, up to my, my, parent, my, my kids' teachers to make those decisions in, in these contexts. And I mean, I do, you know, you get something at home at the beginning of the year, maybe you sign, but on really a day-to-day -day basis, you're, you're, you're leaving it up to the, the teachers to make the right decision. Um, and, and I agree with what everything that every uh, everything has been said. I would say that the one thing I would add to the discussion, or or just from my perspective, again, I I, I come to this as as an, an economist, and I always think about trade offs. Um, I definitely think that it is important to to think about the different dimensions and types of privacy and the harms that come from different aspects. You know, like a a data breach that has sensitive uh, school record information, disciplinary, psych, uh, psychology, all those sort of things, uh, uh, impacts on, you know, future impacts on, on credit rating, all those sort of things. Uh, uh, and, and then, you know, think about that, that's maybe one bucket, safety is another bucket. And then you think about, uh, you know, targeting, ad targeting, which is contentious, and it's, you know, certainly contentious in the adult realm, probably more contentious, and this was front and center in the, the YouTube I know we're not talking about, about uh, that's not ed tech, but the YouTube uh, consent and, and its impact on creator, potential impact on, on creators for children's content. So I, I think there can be trade-offs and you have to, to think, I don't know what the right balance is, um, but, but you, you do have to think about the, the trade-offs at the, the interest and stake because I, I know there's been research with respect to say the GDPR that suggests when you you know, put on, you, 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 you clamp down, you make it hard to comply, you lock down data, well, you end up with more, less competition in some spaces because only maybe some of the largest companies can comply uh, with that. So I think that that is something, you know, again, I don't have the answers. And again, I'm just thinking through this, this is how I work through this as an economist. And there are, there are trade-offs and you have to think about the values, uh, the, the privacy values being implicated and then uh, you know, what are the costs? It doesn't mean that it, you know, that, that uh, the, the uh, limiting, preventing the ability uh, to, to monetize, to target ads uh, on, on children's apps, maybe that's the right way to go. But, but I think that you have to think about the different privacy interests at stake as you're making those policy decisions, because it can kind of, it's like a balloon, it can pop out somewhere else. So, I mean, I'd just put that on the, on, on, on the table. Sure, thank you. Um, so the next question to try to tie in some of the audience questions that we're getting has to do with student privacy legislation and the landscape moving from state to state. Um, so the specific question was the state of Illinois has a new law going into effect on July 1st that will require all districts to publish all district approved apps, links to their privacy policies, designate a privacy officer and develop processes for ongoing review, breach responsibilities and so on. Is every state doing this? So again, what's the landscape of student privacy legislation? So um, I just uh, posted a link in chat. Um, we've been at, at FPF keeping uh, track of all the different student privacy laws. Um, and the legal landscape has changed dramatically over the past six years. We've had over 130 new laws passed. Um, and uh, as James mentioned, I don't necessarily know that those laws have had 
too much impact on the ground because often they're not accompanied with any resources, with any assistance, with any, um, you know, provision of things that actually make it possible for teachers to get the training they need. Um, and so oftentimes when you're looking like even at the you know, the places that do provide training, you're often talking about, you know, 20 or 30 minutes on sort of FERPA 101. It's not um, some of the uh, amazing work that I know Carrie has done is really applying it to the on the ground experience of teachers and how privacy interacts and how you make those privacy trade offs that James was talking about between, you know, providing and making sure that you close the digital divide in the various ways while protecting privacy and balance all of these interests. Um, uh, so we've certainly seen um, laws similar to that that's uh, going forward with in Illinois, I would say probably Colorado maybe uh, the closest, but you know, you can require people to do all you want and they're gonna check the legal boxes, but let, unless you provide the capacity needed, which often means the funding needed, whether at this directly to districts or at the state or regional levels, you're not gonna see that law implemented on the ground and you're not gonna see actual privacy protections come into effect in the way you want. I can't emphasize enough here that um, that is a law that is addressing a, a policy from the 30,000 foot view. And that's likely the privacy officer is likely to be assigned to the assistant superintendent who already has a massive job because that's the person who oversees all state testing, all curriculum changes um, across the whole district. So to ask them to become a privacy officer is a massive lift. And it's not likely that they're able to be able to dedicate a great deal of time to it, which is um, in addition to funding probably the most lacked resource um, in schools. Um, and even if they abide by the expectation of the law or the intent, intent behind the law, that does not mean that what they are doing will make any difference in what teachers do. And the teachers are the ones who have the day-to-day -day contact with the children. And so as Amelia stated, I think it's much more important for us to create opportunities or programs that give teachers access to the information that they need about data privacy rather than requiring more work of these district level administrators who are just getting responsibilities added to their plate over and over and over every time a law is passed with very little efficacy trickling down to the teachers. Not because anybody isn't doing a great job, they are. They're just doing the best they can with additional responsibilities and no added time or funding to, um, to make that happen. I would, I would really like to echo that from uh, what we've seen in California. One prime example of that is our Ed Code uh, Section 49073.1, but what's popularly known as AB 1584 in California. And that particular um, bill, the reason why I bring that up is where it's sort of landed in, in, in different uh, agencies across California, handled it differently or didn't handle it at all, but where a lot of that uh, actually fell in in California was in the directors or, or the directors or the CTO, the chief technology officers lap. And what that specific uh, law says is that for any um, any contract or any um, uh, agreement uh, that a agency went into with a third party vendor, you know, cloud vendor that collects student information, there were nine specific things that that vendor had to attest to and say that uh, they are that, that is a part of their privacy law that the data resides with the the school district or or the um, the public uh, school entity and, and there are nine specific things and where that landed was not with the associate superintendent on the curriculum side it, it ended up with uh, uh, the the technology directors so and not only are are we now uh, charged with trying to get uh, uh, the bandwidth outside of the schools, you know, into the students' homes to protect the devices. Uh, but now we have to check these uh, agreements, and we're not lawyers, uh, but we have to check these agreements because they usually come through us and uh, make sure that the vendor 
has met those nine conditions. And if they haven't, then we're involved with having this discussion with the vendor and saying, well, you know, the, the, the contract is technically null and void, uh, whether it's a renewal or it's brand new, unless you meet these agreements. So now we're getting into that realm. And when, when it got past what we could convince the vendor to do, we would have to go to legal. Uh, one thing I will say that we have done in California is uh, uh, the, the organization that I'm on the board of, and I was past president of a site, we have put together uh, a, a, a student, um, California Student Privacy Alliance, where we're really working hard to help our districts with these issues because uh, the, the technology directors are, are, and, and CTOs are, are, are really struggling with this and struggling with our teachers, struggling with our administrators. We're trying to do, just like Carrie said, we're doing the best we can, uh, but this was yet, a, it was well-intentioned, but yet another unfunded mandate in the state of California. Can I just add something on here too? Because the, my, uh, my experience as an educator is that our CTOs are often expertise, um, their expertise is in the technology field, but not necessarily in teaching and learning. There's very few CTOs that I know who have been classroom teachers, um, or if they were, it was a long time ago, and teaching looked significantly different than it does now. Um, and that doesn't mean that CTOs are not qualified to do what they do, they are. And most classroom educators are not qualified, nor have any desire to become CTOs, because that's not where their passions or expertise lie. So it is different forms of expertise, but in districts that are exceptionally large, the CTO says, yes, it's approved or no, it's not approved based on policy, but is there a process in place to drill down and ask, why was that tool requested in the first place? What is the teaching and learning experience that a teacher really wants their students to have that that tool is providing? And if this tool doesn't meet privacy guidelines, how can we make sure that we are still empowering our teachers and students to be able to have access to some other tool that allows them to have that teaching and learning experience. Those are the processes that we really need to be spending our time looking at because the policy, we have plenty of policies. The policies are there. Um, we're not lacking in policies. We're lacking in systems that allow both privacy protection and high quality innovative teaching and learning to happen in the same place. It's often like one has to be sacrificed for the other, and it really shouldn't be an either or situation. I, I would like to just say I totally agree with that. I, I, I think that, um, you know, in California, we do have um, a, a number of entities, large ones and even some medium sized ones where there's really, really good collaboration between the CTOs and uh, the curricular staff. Um, there, there's that articulation. Um, and, you know, even in, in California through our CTO mentor program through SITE, uh, we spend a great deal of time uh, teaching because we have a lot of CTOs that did come up the uh, curricular route. We have a lot like my like myself who came up the IT route. And one of the things we really do is uh, try to uh, blend the, those two uh, skill sets and, and, and focus areas so that one understands the other. And that in, in, in California is one of the main things in our CTO mentor program so that we can do exactly that and have these discussions and understand each other when we're having them. Uh, but that said, again, I think, uh, Carrie, you, you mentioned this earlier when we, before we started the uh, uh, webinar that one of the biggest uh, resource um, areas that we don't have enough of is time. And so, you know, both from the standpoint of the teacher and the standpoint of the CTO, you know, you want to have these meetings, you want to have these articulations, you want to have these discussions, uh, but we're, we're running 150 miles an hour. So when do you find the time to sit down and have that? Um, so I, I totally agree. I think that, you know, in both professions, we have high quality uh, people who know their, their craft, uh, but how do we get them together so that we can have these discussions? Because uh, we have to have high quality learning, uh, but we can't just brush off the law. Uh, so we, we have to find a way to do both. Awesome. And we are definitely moving into this, but if we could get to best practices or what is working. So teachers need to understand and know certain things when it comes to adopting and using ed tech. So what are those things they need to be aware of? And, you know, Carrie and, and Lori, what is working in terms of providing training to teachers on the ground during, you know, right now with everything going on? Well, um, I would just say again, what we're seeing in California, especially in this uh, 
period of, of COVID-19 is those those entities, those agencies that had already uh, had a program in place where there was training um, on student data privacy and there was training on uh, innovative practices in the classroom, you know, pedagogy that's, that, that utilized uh, technology in, in effective ways. Where that was already happening, um, that was carried forward when we saw ourselves forced into distance learning. Um, what we've seen, particularly in underserved communities where there wasn't a lot of that for a variety of reasons, one of which was just, you know, the pure um, resource issue of having devices, of having bandwidth, of, of providing um, uh, parents and, and families with the information they need to be able to support the students when they're learning at home. Uh, unfortunately, in, in a lot of our underserved communities, and particularly a lot, a lot of our urban areas, uh, that wasn't happening before, and we're still seeing that it, it's, 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 it, the, the students are the ones that are losing out, they're losing um, their, their education, they're learning, uh, because uh, we still are running to try to catch up. I mean, I know some entities where they're still trying to get hotspots out to students. And so, you know, when you're talking about student data privacy, uh, you, you can't even get into that discussion when you're trying to get hotspots out to students or you have hotspots out, but it's a Verizon hotspot and they don't have good coverage there. So now you're trying to figure out how to get uh, just the basics to, 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 to our, our, our students. So teachers are, you know, how, how can they grapple with dealing with privacy when they're trying to figure out how to carry out their lesson plan, they can't, you know, even reach their students. So it, it's, it's really a, a difficult situation in some of our areas, our underserved areas, some of our rural areas. Uh, and, and that's not to say that I feel like uh, student data privacy should be put to the uh, back burner, but you know we have to do first things first. And what we're seeing right now is a, a real struggle in some areas just to address the basics. And then once we get there, you know how do we? Um, and we haven't answered that question across the board. Uh, how do we educate our teachers on student data privacy? Uh, when they, some of them are working remotely or they're coming into the classroom and now their workload has tripled or quadrupled because they're doing um, they're, they're teaching a different way because of how they have to do it uh, with distance learning. So how do you tell a teacher who now is working, you know, um, more hours a day than they've ever worked that you need to attend this data student data privacy uh, training that we put together for you and did we even do a good job of putting together putting it together for you when we're still running out here trying to figure out how to get uh, bandwidth to to some of your students in in areas that they're they're not uh, uh, readily available. So it, it 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 is a very very difficult problem in some areas right now. So to try to like spin it positive because I know the question was what's working. Um, there was also a comment while Lori while you were talking to from somebody in our audience named Kara about an infographic. So this isn't something that I could share because it's specific to my institution, but we created a, a red, yellow, green um, infographic for our teachers with examples of apps that are like always approved. Like these are things you can always use as students 100% of the time. And then the yellow area was, these are things we have approved in certain instances, but it's important that you ask us for the guidelines before you use it with students. And the red zone are things that have been requested in the past, but that we haven't approved. And then been on that graphic, in addition to like the little app logos, which are very pretty, right? Because they're created by those graphic design artists who are part of the marketing team of, you know, the ed tech companies. Um, we would put the reasons, right? So here are common reasons why things are in the red zone, common reasons why things are in the yellow zone, and common reasons why things are in the green zone. So it, it's like a really clear visual um, explanation of what data privacy is and how it applies to the tools that our teachers are accustomed to using. Um, maybe it's not as in depth as like a, a nice solid training that all of us would love to have an ideal world, but it is really easy for a teacher to reference um, when they need it. Um, and that's something that any district could do. And it really speaks to what James was talking about in terms of the cost benefit analysis of certain tools. That's why there are some in the yellow zone, right? So. Um, a really great example of that that I use all the time is we have a, whenever a student gets a concussion, okay, and 
that means that they're limited in terms of their ability to look at screens for a certain number of days. But they don't want to get, they don't want to not engage in school at all. They, they want to do or keep up with as much as they can, and yet they still want to recover. Um, we, uh, there's, um, I'm sure you can think of the name of the company that has your, your typical audiobook app, right? So that audiobook app is not approved for children um, at all. It's meant to be an adult tool, and it is not approved for K-12. But if the parent requests it so that their child who has a concussion can listen to a novel that's been assigned in their English class, for instance, um, we can figure out a way to get that child access to that app so that he can, in the midst of his concussion, still engage somewhat with the curriculum without having to look at a screen and risk his health. And that's uh, you know, one example of something that could be in the yellow zone given certain circumstances um, and that we're willing to work with a teacher or a family on. So, and there's a million other examples I could give of things that have been in the yellow zone. Um, but that's one example of something that does work. It's not hard to create um, on my end for my team. Um, and it's not hard for teachers to look at and understand on their end. And it's not a big time suck. It doesn't take a lot of funding. Um, and that's something that works really well. So that's, that's just one suggestion. Thank you for that specific example. And I think an audience question ties in here as we're speaking to specific um, apps and services. Um, so the question is, how do student tracking technologies such as Securely and GoGuardian interact with Fourth Amendment student privacy standards? So typically a search must be justified at its inception where these technologies seem to be searching and collecting student info without ever initially justifying the search. So as uh, the designated student privacy lawyer, I guess <laughs> uh, that one's to me. So um, it, this is a fairly complicated question. I imagine uh, we've got a lawyer in the audience. Uh, and um, the standard federally set by the Supreme Court gives a fair amount of discretion to schools and school administrators um, in rulings after uh, TLO uh, that allow them to, under an administrative search doctrine, sort of uh, go ahead and proactively uh, not have to meet quite the warrant standard that law enforcement um, as a government entity would have to meet because um, you have day-to-day -day incidents in school that shouldn't have to rise to that. Um, you know, and in states that uh, have put a higher standard in place for schools have required that schools go to law enforcement in order to get a warrant um, to search devices. Um, you've had a lot of unintended consequences where things maybe don't rise to that or administrators reasonably don't want to further the school to prison pipeline and so you uh you had you know for example uh students um that were having you know non-consensually shared sensitive images um and uh they had an idea of who was doing it but it didn't rise to that it didn't rise to the standard that would have allowed them to search. Um, but nationally, you have this lower standard. You also have the fact that often these monitoring technologies are installed on school devices or only scanning school accounts, um, which again, there's a much more flexible legal standard uh, when it comes to monitoring these things. And you actually have a lot of state laws um, that have put a burden on districts to make sure that they detect cyberbullying, searches for self-harm, um, uh, inappropriate uh, access to content. Um, and if they do not monitor those things and something happens um, related to what is happening on those school devices or in those school accounts, um, they are liable in many states by law or maybe found liable in court. And so it's a really, you know, again, talking about these balances here, uh, schools are often be between a rock and a hard place in terms of how much that they have to monitor. And with 
school taking place from the kitchen table, that equation has only become more difficult. And the legal questions around, you know, uh, the Fourth Amendment implications of still monitoring, you know, when students are at home uh, have only gotten more complicated. Um, so on a practical level and, you know, relating it back to the teacher training aspect here, this is where, you know, study after study after study has said that, you know, surveillance, monitoring, et cetera, you know, uh, uh, detection of self-harm is, you know, can possibly be a useful tool anecdotally. I don't think we've seen studies on this um, that have actually proven that point beyond anecdotes. But the number one thing that helps students is a trusted relationship with an adult. And you don't have a trusted relationship with someone parachuting in and saying, I saw the thing that you typed into Google the other day. Um, and so how do you, um, how do you make sure that um, teachers are equipped, have the information, balance these legal obligations? Um, haven't even talked about the Children's Internet Protection Act, which also requires monitoring by schools. Um, and um, make sure that at the end of the day, you're doing the best thing possible for students. Thank you, Amelia, for tackling that question. And another um, maybe tough question is, is getting at the use of social media in schools, especially now with the shift to online learning. Um, so the question in Q&A is, how receptive do you think our schools when it comes to Facebook's surveillance capitalism? Do schools still use Facebook despite outright unethical practices um, and usage of certain content for profit? Um, so, you know, kind of looking at one company, but just generally, of course, we've seen um, teachers in schools try to use social media to engage, you know, with students. Um, yeah. um, I can speak to that. I because I use social media pretty heavily. Um, so I, um, I think it's really important that schools are able to use social media as a marketing tool. Um, to really share the good work that they're doing. 